Welcome, everyone. Hello and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you're coming from. Uh, this is the Hyperledger Foundation Healthcare Special Interest Group meeting, and we are here to discuss some of the updates and developments in the community. So before I get started here, my name is Ray Dogo. I'm the chair of the special interest group. Thank you all for joining again. And before we get into a list of updates I've, I've noticed in the last couple of weeks, I would like for any of you to introduce yourselves if you haven't already done so to the group here. So I'll just open up the floor to anyone here. By the way, this is being recorded and it will be published on YouTube as well. Um, I, I, I can start. This is my first meeting, so I definitely haven't introduced myself to anybody in the group. Um, my name's Sid Hanif. I'm based in Brighton in the UK. Um, I'm sort of, um, I'm, I'm, I've joined for a couple of reasons. I'm, I've um, been, I'm working with a group of others around developing um, a, a platform using, you know, verifiable credentials um, for, for healthcare and healthcare data. Um, so um, this seems, you know, a, a good intersection between, you know, the hyperledger VC type bits and, and the healthcare. Um, I, I, I was going to say I feel like an imposter, but this time it's real imposter syndrome in that I'm not a healthcare professional. I worked a very long time ago on healthcare apps. So the others in my group are the healthcare folks, and I'm 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 the, the technical person. Um, I have worked in healthcare apps um, a, 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 a while back, um, and I'm also sort of part of the um, Trust Over IP Foundation as a sort of contributing member there. Um, again, around the verifiable credentials side, more than that. So, so um, that's a brief, hopefully not too brief introduction. Well, hopefully not too long as well. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happy to answer any other questions as you go along. That's fantastic. Thank you, Sid, for for doing that. Really appreciate it. And it's interesting you work on verifiable credentials. That is an important component of many of the applications that, including healthcare, um, that we need to figure out, I think, because identity is still a, is still an issue online. So mm. anybody yeah, else sense. would like to share their, a brief, um, introduce themselves to the group. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here as well. So you can see the agenda for today. Can everybody see my screen uh, with the Hyperledger meeting? All right, awesome. Um, so uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and just present some of the upcoming events that are happening really quickly. So in August, we have the Stanford Science of Blockchain event that's coming up. In September 12th to the 14th, the Hyperledger Global Forum will be happening. You can save 20% if you want to purchase tickets. That'll be in Ireland, in Dublin. So any European folks might be interested in that as well, um, since you're pretty close to it. Uh, but there are some interesting things at that event that are related to healthcare. So it's more broadly about Hyperledger and blockchain and DLT. But there are three events that I found that are specifically targeting uh, healthcare people. So how 3.0, how a DeFi enabled tokenized data economy will reinvent healthcare and put patients first. That was with Heather Flannery from Equidium. There'll be a demo on achieving pharma supply chain resilience with blockchain. So that'll be by uh, Daniel from Zulig Pharma. And there's a panel discussion about the best practices for leading healthcare and life sciences, blockchain production deployments, and advanced research investigations. Uh, that'll be with a, a bunch of folks here who I'm actually quite familiar with. So that'll be interesting too. Additionally, there's a Converge 2X symposium on September 15th. That'll be in Austin, Texas. And this event has been going on for a number of years. They're specifically focused on blockchain and healthcare. So highly recommend that event as well. Uh, in September 23rd and 24th, there'll be an, a DSI, Decentralized Science Boston event. Um, and November 13th to the 16th in Las Vegas, we have the Health 2022 event, which is always a, a large health IT sort of 
event. Are there any other events that you may be aware of that you want to share with the community here today? Hi, Ray, this is Wendy. Um, I actually don't have any to share. I normally specify what I am speaking in, but I don't have any, uh, I can't think of anything else. Okay, no worries. How you doing, Wendy? Nice to see you there. Um, okay, in that case, I think the next thing we could be doing here is just discussing some of the uh, articles I found over the last couple of weeks related to blockchain, just some interesting things that might be impacting our way of thinking in the industry. Um, because this is still relatively new, decentralized ledger technologies haven't really, you know, um, revolutionized healthcare or any industry fully yet. I think we're in the progress of seeing that in the finance space and the economy um, through DeFi and things like that. But let's start here with the Bloomberg article the crypto firm Nomad loses nearly $200 million in a bridge hack. So, you know, as you may be aware, there's many, many types of claims about how blockchain and crypto is dangerous and it's a fad. So things like this, where you see a company lose hundreds of millions of dollars in a hack, for sure, it kind of takes the community um, by surprise. Well, maybe not by surprise, but at least it shocks the community in a bit. And it kind of steers them away from crypto, you know, because just because of the fear of, of losing money here. Um, again, there are many bridges between different blockchains. So this term bridge is just used to explain how you can connect to different blockchain ecosystems or networks more seamlessly. So Nomad is a, is a major protocol that does this. So it's used for transferring crypto tokens across different blockchains. Um, there was a security exploit. It looks like they were drained of the funds over hours in small batches by various accounts. Um, there's still an investigation ongoing about this, so there's no clear things that have been explained. But I did notice this morning that I think the hacker returned $9 million back to Nomad, which was interesting. Uh, I don't have that article here, but um, just to follow up on this one. Yeah, I, thought, I mean, you know, we also saw earlier this year, Axie Infinity, they also had a bridge and they lost about $600 million in March. So this is not the first time this has happened to a bridge protocol. And it just goes to show you that there are still vulnerabilities with this type of technology. And, you know, before we completely launched these types of technologies in healthcare. I know how conservative healthcare it is. So we want to make sure that um, the security is pretty tight. Any comments or thoughts here from the community or members about this hack? This is Wendy. Um, what is a bridge hack? So, so um, let me start off by explaining like what a, a bridge protocol is. It's basically a way for, for example, you have NFTs on Polygon or you have cryptocurrencies on the Polygon network and you want to um, simply transfer those tokens on a different blockchain into like Ethereum, for example. That's what a bridge protocol enables. So it creates like a seamless connection to other blockchain protocols. A bridge hack, just from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone is more familiar, familiar with this, is hackers just found a vulnerability within that system, within those protocols, and was able to basically take the, the funds, the crypto money, and deposit it in their own wallets, essentially. Um, again, there's still an investigation ongoing, but that's a good question, Wendy. And maybe it's something I can like look into so that maybe in our next meeting we can discuss like, so what is a bridge like in more detail and how does that really work? Because it's something that I don't think we'll be seeing less of. I think because of this, uh, you know, the many different blockchains we have in the ecosystem, 
I think we'll continue to see bridges. So yeah, that's my simple okay. explanation. Hope that was that helpful. Is, I, I appreciate that. We're always learning. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a way to make blockchains more interoperable, if that helps. Um, and it says here, for example, the complexity of bridge software can lead to errors and make them vulnerable for, for exploitation, um, said the chief information security officer at Polygon. Since bridges control huge amounts of assets, it also makes them an attractive target for hackers. So... Yeah. Ray, I just offer since I I'm always free to offer my opinion on this for in this forum. Um, this is where blockchain as a word gets a bad name because these are basic security 101 supply chain vulnerability issues that are just aren't addressed. So people slap this crap together because it's all Web3 and ain't it cool without actually doing proper security vulnerability assessments that any financial institution would potentially do or operate in a secure way. And so somebody finds an easy five cent code vulnerability and takes out millions of dollars in, in stored value um, because they weren't implemented proper to begin with and blockchain gets a bad name out of it. Appreciate that, Jim, thank you. And one thing to also note, there are companies now that all they do, like their services is specifically on helping these companies find security vulnerabilities and assess uh, the security of the company overall. So um, I'm sure we're going to see those types of companies con continue to grow as well. <clears throat> OK. Speaking as a Linux Foundation project, I would remind everybody about the availability of free training on best practices for open source code development and secure code and the use of the open source SIG store program for um, signing your secure code as part of development. Awesome. And Jim, where can people find that? Uh, OpenSSF.org, the OpenSSF. Open Source Security Foundation project at the Linux Foundation. Perfect. Thank you for that. Okay. The next article I thought it was worth sharing here is I did see this Daily Mail article claiming, uh, or it said a House Intelligence Committee member warns people not to share their health data with sites like 23andMe because it can be used to program new bioweapons to target them. So from reading this, it did kind of seem alarmist a little bit, this article. I think um, it claimed that, where did it say? It says, U.S. Senator from Iowa, Johnny Ernst, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, said that U.S. rivals could use such DNA bioweapons to target food supplies on a vast scale. So Ernst warned that biological weapons could be used to target animals that citizens troops and cities depend on bringing about scarcity and food insecurity to weaken people so you know um personally i have shared my 23 and me i I've, I've used 23 and me um there's benefits to that there are risks and when i did it it was before blockchain actually or before blockchain and healthcare um there are now companies web3 companies that allow you to get your dna sequenced and can keep that information relatively private and secure. So if I had to go back, I would probably have would waited. So I wouldn't have done 23andMe. I would have used like, for example, Nebula Genomics or another service uh, that is Web3 based. But I just wanted to highlight like how crucial your DNA data could be, how important and, and sensitive it could be here. So let me see if I can find some other quotes that might be interesting uh, yeah here it says last year uh, senator marco rubio sounded the alarm that russian and chinese labs were processing dna tests of americans through medicare and medicaid so we're outsourcing a lot of this work uh, allegedly to russia and china um, again i haven't done a deep dive into this so i don't know for sure what's happening but it is a reason to be concerned i guess um Although there is something here in 2018, Ancestry, 23andMe, Habit, Helix, and MyHeritage all signed on to the policy drafted with the help of the Future of Privacy Forum. It's a nonprofit in, supporting, uh, in support of advancing responsible data practices in support of emerging technologies. So 
this is a policy agreement between these companies, I think not to share or to make sure that the data is handled very securely. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly an alarmist tone to this article. I don't know if others have opinions on this or. It's consistent with the Daily Mail or editorial policy. I'll say that. I'll say that. It's and consistent with that. Yeah, so yeah. That, that they, they, well, the Daily Mail's editorial policy in that yeah. is that perfect spectrum between, you know, something bad's going to happen and health issues. They like stories like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, Did I get. Mm -hmm. Did I get this right? So Medicare and Medicaid sell Americans information to China because they will process it cheaper because they get to use the information for their own purposes. Right? Well, so I think it's not the information itself, but the DNA tests. So I don't know if the physical samples are going to China and Russia. And we're not making any claims about this. Again, this is just um, one article. but. I think it's the actual samples. That's what I would imagine. Uh, I don't know why they would send the information or the data, maybe to process that information for some reason, but I feel like we have capable people in America to do that. Um, and we don't have labs in America that can. So it might have been because of the samples. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's because um, of uh, COVID, where we had to just have more samples processed more quickly so it's a matter of you That's know what our, I'm saying yeah it, it is selling. Insane. i don't think they were selling we were probably paying well no that's what i'm party. saying if you're paying less then it's a subsidy it's the same as selling oh i see okay yeah um, no subsidies are not the same as as selling in a contractual sense but i was glancing i was digging up the article as quickly as i could because i hadn't really read it and essentially you have uh domestic operations of chinese owned facilities that are labs so when you say hey we could do it in america the answer is it's being done in america now whether or not that is with a lab that is owned or has a mature or which a chinese firm has a majority interest is a different story. And, and let's not forget that that's kind of tricky. If I pass a law that says all DNA testing has to occur within the continental United States, everybody will salute and do it. Unfortunately, it's a different issue to then sort out that that lab testers can't have uh, or can't be majority owned by um, foreign interests uh, or that it has to be U.S. national only. Those are essentially security measures that you really only get at the DOD level. And, uh, and the answer is, yeah, you're going to pay a hell of a lot for, for implementing those restrictions. And when you think of the volume of testing done in Medicaid, Medicaid and Medicare, um, I don't think that a domestically owned U.S. only facilities um, are, are adequate for getting it all done. Just my thought. Sure. Yeah, it's a supply issue in, in many ways. Um, yeah, I mean, it also says here that technology could lead to highly targeted assassination programs and also make it harder for killers to be tracked down. So, yeah. Um, well, there's other... a good use case for uh, the, the kind of lab that you can share. So then the kind of lab that is shared by people and, and anyone who wants to process their own 23andMe can, or their own genetic information can go into that lab and, and then they keep the data instead of it belonging to the lab. What do you think about that? I sure. like it, but the tough thing is we just don't have laws to do that. The U.S. doesn't care about that. U.S. as citizens don't care about that. And so we don't have the sort of similar protections that you have, say, in the EU that's starting to mandate more and more the data of EU citizens is kept in the EU on EU servers um, that, you know, data, data sales or data transactions have to have consent. We, we don't have any of those frameworks because we don't care. Uh, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, you know, I've just grown to say we don't care as a general statement because I know you care, I care, probably everybody else on this call cares. But, uh, you know, we simply, we simply can't seem to get any of these initiatives. We can't elect state and federal government representatives they tear enough to get it done selectively. 14 states have tried to pass 
watered down versions of GDPR. 13 states have failed. One has passed. None of them have the sort of um, obligations and liabilities for uh, private companies that you have in the GDPR model. So I just don't. And, and sorry, you're, sorry. You're aware that five, five states have passed GDPR-like statutes, right? Was that Wendy? Yeah, this is Wendy. Five, yeah, it, I'd it, love it, to it, compare. It, yeah, I'd love to compare yeah. notes with you on that. The last I saw from the uh, International Association of Privacy Professionals legislative update was there were 14 out there and 13 had failed. I'm aware of a couple more failures. I'm not sure which oh, no. of the five are. Uh, no, five have passed. Um, of course, starting with California, Virginia, Colorado, <laughs> Oregon. Well, C I would just I would just offer a technical point that CCPA is not really considered a a model for GDPR. It, it has some um, elements, but well, CCPA is outdated. It's CPRA is the latest version that was passed. That's by right. And it's much closer to GDPR. I perform the state by state analysis um, because we, as a data management company, have to manage privacy for each of the states as well. No, I mean accommodate each of the states and so we we had to design flexibility into our platform to be able to accommodate emerging privacy statutes i will put a link in the chat about what the current status is but there's absolutely five states that have passed and most of them go into effect in 2023 oh that's excellent yeah i'd like to take a look because i think the yeah the, the uh, IIP, iapp page the, at least the last I looked at it was was closer to the beginning of the year. So I'd like to see what the updates are for the other ones. So, but yeah, I know you mentioned Virginia. Florida's died in the Senate. Um, I wasn't sure about Colorado. I completely forgot about CPR. Oh, so Utah, Utah wins the um, the fifth. Okay, so, cool. Utah, interesting. So in California, you're not allowed to sell yeah. our information. Uh, your, your website has to have a do not sell my information button. That's the California law doesn't require that all of the information stay in the United States. It just requires that you do not sell it anywhere. Am I right? Wendy, I'll turn to you because I'm not sure what CPRA specifies. I remember under CCPA, they basically left PHI out of it and just left it under HIPAA regulations. Oh, but I don't know yes. Um, so uh, there are in CPRA, there are maybe like 18 different exceptions for being able to um, control and remove your data. Um, health information is deliberately excluded, as is research related information, but not repositories. So they're, they're in, there are some nonprofits that are excluded. It's just a long, it's a long list of exclusions. It's actually really complicated. And this is, um, these are the type of details that I go through with some of our customers just to determine whether it actually applies. Thanks, Wendy. Appreciate it, guys. Um, I'm going to be moving on to the next article here, but I think, you know, a discussion on CPRA in the future might be interesting for the, the group here. Um, okay, so third article here is from Gizmodo. 32 data brokers are selling over 2.9 billion profiles of US citizens uh, that are considered potentially or actively pregnant or shopping for maternity products. Why does this matter? Well, as we know, Roe v. Wade uh, the legislation or there has been a change and now that um, people are able to almost rat other people out who are pregnant and they can uh, really feel some penalties on that. So data companies are actually sharing a lot of this information, unfortunately, and putting a lot of women at risk of, you know, legal issues. So um, so they're doing that because they want to sell them birth control pills or something or what's that the morning after pills? No, unfortunately, I think it's more, um, more concerning than that, actually. So let me take a look here. I didn't fully read this article, actually. So I would like to just quickly zoom through it as well. So in total, Gizmodo identified 32 brokers selling 2.9 profiles uh, also on the market. 
data on 478 million customer profiles labeled as interested in pregnancy. So basically, um, let me see here. Federal law enforcement has been all over data brokers and app troves for years. Just recently, a watchdog group revealed that Coinbase had been selling data on crypto users to U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, I think the concern here is that women could be prosecuted for illegal abortions, right? So can local state police use the data since they're able to buy it freely? They can take that data, analyze it, and determine which individuals, which women were pregnant, and then maybe all of a sudden weren't, and they can use that information to investigate whether or not the woman had an abortion. Um, and that's the, that's the issue I think this article is trying to present. And thank, thanks. We couldn't hear you, Wendy. Can you say that again? So um, I, um, I had um, an incredible experience last week. Um, I sat at a table at a local conference with the former president of the American Medical Association. And she was talking about how in some jurisdictions now, um, gynecologists and obstetricians are receiving death threats um, afraid for their lives. Um, some fertility clinics have had to greatly step up security. And in some states, uh, women are being charged for when there is a, an apparent miscarriage because it, the goal is to further intimidate them from performing abortions. It was some um, it was a different perspective than I had heard, and it was um, it was very disturbing for those of us who've been in the medical space for how doctors are now being targeted. Yeah, absolutely. I think doctors, gynecologists who would like to potentially help these women in many cases simply can't do that, or if they do, they're going to fear for their own prosecution as well, so... Yeah, like the, this, um, this, the most recent past president of the AMA told me she's an oncologist and there are certain medications, of course, um, very toxic in chemotherapy that can um, induce a, accidentally induce a miscarriage. And she said she's had to get extra malpractice insurance. She's been threatened with lawsuits. Um, she said previously when a pregnant woman would come in for care um, for her cancer, um, they had to talk about lots of aspects of contraceptives. And she said now she's afraid um, she's going to be prosecuted for practicing oncology. You know, maybe it's an overreaction, but it's the reality of people's fears. And um, I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile to be... Um, it, it really shook, let me just say, it shook me, and I'm not going to um, speak for anyone else. For sure, and this is definitely a, a sensitive topic here in the United States. Um, I think that, you know, this is not going away, this issue. I have seen some apps, some like apps that measure uh, menstrual cycles. They have enabled an, an, an anonymous mode so that users can use the app without their data. However, I kind of push back on that thinking that there's still some cookies somewhere being tracked um, against their other browser habits. So I don't know how effective that is. I'm sure if someone is really, really motivated, they can, they're able to find that data, um, especially law enforcement who have maybe more access in some ways. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just curious, does anyone know of any blockchain web three companies trying to specifically address the issue regarding um you know pregnant women and abortions and, and that stuff i haven't found any either so 
just a note here, commercial data could be the next step. In an interview, uh, the Fourth Amendment Center Director for National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers called this kind of commercial data on pregnancies a really valuable treasure trove. Overzealous prosecutors could buy this information from data brokers and start following, start to follow through and decide what behavior looks suspect enough to prosecute. So yeah, um, just wanted to let you guys know this was, you know, an interesting article, I thought, um, overall. So we'll probably be talking about this types of issues in the future as well. Okay, uh, this protocol article, this was too many prescription ads on TikTok, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, which is helping to fuel a prescription drug boom. So lots of prescription drugs are being prescribed through these social media apps. So basically you have teenagers and young adults being bombarded with advertisements to try a new pharmaceutical drug. And I think that it's interesting because in some countries, other countries outside the US, you know, you're not allowed to have TV commercials with drugs uh, being advertised. Um, I don't know what the policy is in, in the UK regarding TikTok or other social media app ads. I don't know if Sid, you're aware of any thing regarding that it, it is um they don't fall under the same sort of um broadcast restrictions as as um you know television is i think there's been you know talk but i think that's all it's been about developing policies for it but i think i don't think as far as i know there's anything there but yeah you, you're right along the um on on television and other sort of like you know make, um mass mass channels like that there is there are restrictions but yeah tiktok not aware of um yeah interesting yeah it says here the u.s is almost alone in embracing direct to consumer prescription advertisements drug advertisements nations as desperate as disparate as saudi arabia france china all find common ground in banning such ads in fact all developed nations only new zealand joins the U.S. and giving pharmaceutical companies a direct line to consumers. It's very interesting. And, you know, this is not news. We probably already all know, knew this to some degree. But, um, yeah, it's... And you can see the results from this, right? We can see how, I don't want to say addicted Americans are to prescriptions, but there is an increased amount of users in America. So here, um, yeah, Americans are highly medicated. A Mayo Clinic study from 2013 found that nearly 70% of Americans regularly took at least one prescription drug. Um, yeah, so, and I think the most concerning thing here is most of these new drugs that are being advertised are mental health related drugs. So for ADHD, so things like Adderall uh, and other habit forming drugs um, are being pushed through social media and you know most people who are using social media are on the younger side so yeah there's a concern there oh i also wanted to mention that i did watch a pretty good john oliver episode recently on mental health and he talks about some of the stuff that you know mental health companies are doing to push their agenda i guess you could say Cele cerebral was one of the companies that was mentioned in that episode so I recommend if you guys haven't watched that to check it out on YouTube. Any thoughts or opinions on this? Are we how are we mitigating this using DLTs, Hyperledger, blockchain? Is there any examples of companies you guys are aware of that are? I mean, it's a tough problem because it's mainly regulatory, right? It's still legal to do this, so we're not going to stop companies from doing it. Um, but yeah. Okay, next on the list here is from Healthcare IT News, debunking some of healthcare's biggest blockchain myths. So this was an interview with the CTO, Chief Technology Officer at Zealous. Um, and Zealous is a healthcare payments company. He's a blockchain expert. And 
this was pretty interesting, I thought, just to discuss his perspective. Uh, what are the primary use cases for blockchain? You know, they discuss privacy and data security as a major use case. Um, what are some of the myths that persist about blockchain and healthcare? So there's still a lot of confusion surrounding blockchain since it's relatively new. Uh, the confusion that blockchain and Bitcoin are the same likely stems from blockchain's association with Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So we're aware of this confusion, I think, here. Uh, we're probably, uh, you know, the members here are probably more, uh, a little more sophisticated and understand that blockchain, Bitcoin is a blockchain, but there are many types of blockchain networks that can be developed. Uh, another myth is that blockchain can only be used for cryptocurrency, but using blockchain and cryptocurrency together is an ideal pairing given the secure and, un and, sec and the traceable nature of technology. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, this is Wendy. Um, I wrote this article when it first came out and I kept checking the date because like it felt like this would have been pertinent four years ago. Yes. <laughs> I... Um, because we're, we're, we have encountered different myths lately and uh, different use cases. So I, um, I just felt this to be really short on content. One of the, the uh, myths that I would also like to dispel that he put forth is that about security because a blockchain is only as secure as the nature of the design and the programming utilized. And blockchain inherently isn't necessarily more secure as we learn from all of the breaches and hacks. And um, it's really about how an organization designs the, the infrastructure in which it occurs. Beautiful summary, Wendy. I couldn't Great agree point. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Um, some people just ardently disagree with me. And then I have to describe like, for our health blockchain, we have to track intrusion detection. We track malware, virus scanning. We have to put, we have about 10 to 12 different systems that we have to add to our blockchain in order to provide additional security. So it's really not just about blockchain itself being secure, but how you design it. And, and, and my puppet. <laughs> Absolutely. It goes right back to my comments earlier. So we have still the blockchain will save the world crowd that doesn't want to pay attention to basic NIST security controls. And then we have articles like this that offer no education at all in 2022. And, and very well said, Wendy, it's like something we would have written, you and I would have written in 2015. Um, I agreed. Yeah, I, I mean, it, we just can't seem to move the ball forward if people understanding basics here. It's still all the hype and the buzz and the magic and so on. Agreed. Thank you. Well stated, Jim. Excellent. Thanks, guys, for that input. Next is a Forbes article. Watch out Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Blockchain is coming for you. So this is another probably... Unless Facebook controls the blockchain. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and the metaverse as well. So not too deep, this article, but just wanted to raise awareness that Forbes is continuing to raise some awareness about blockchain with its business community and, and members. Um, so conversations today is less about social media platforms dominating our personal expressions, but the shift away from platform economy that has dominated Web 2.0 to the open source self-identification economy that will dominate the next 10 years. So open source is definitely becoming more of a hot topic, which, you know, I think it has been for the last 10 years. That's how, how I perceive it. But um, especially since we're sitting in an open source forum. Yeah, right <laughs> exactly. Right, Jim. Um, this stretches yeah. across financial and healthcare sectors and even how governments sustain sovereign control over the value of near anything as each of us becomes our own market, physical and virtual, that is protected by our own digital wallet and the power of blockchain technologies. Okay. One curious way that you can stay current on which companies are moving into blockchain is to subscribe for job notices just for the word blockchain in LinkedIn. And like, I was surprised how aggressively Amazon is hiring for its health blockchain. 
and how many companies that are traditionally conservative are hiring for blockchain positions. So that's just another way to see um, it, where the movement is going. Yeah, I wasn't actually aware of uh, Amazon's interest uh, in blockchain and healthcare. So that's they don't glad you mentioned that. It. I think they're trying to build infrastructure. The only way I know about it is because I keep receiving push messages from LinkedIn that Amazon is hiring engineers for its health blockchain. Interesting. So I know they're. I don't know if they'll commercialize it or not. So. Sure. I mean, I know about their acquisition of One Medical. So that was huge. Um, very interesting. Wendy, I think that's a tremendous point because if you think about the blockchain and healthcare HIMSS panel, which I think you were on, I know Heather was on. Or yeah. There, yeah. 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 I mean, it's great to hear Anthem talking about them using blockchain, but you know, if all they're doing is using blockchain in an internal deployment to keep up their otherwise um, horrible healthcare pre-authorization denial system. <laughs> You're not, you're not, you're not changing the world. You're not transforming healthcare. It's not decentralization. So shut up. Yeah. Well said. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, I found this article by a Bitcoinist. So this is a new company from what I've seen. Immunity Life. I don't know too much about them, but they are trying to um, create a new healthcare related network for tokenization of healthcare data. Um, they, it seems like they want to do a lot. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this company, but it was designed to combat or to combat these challenges related to um, just managing data. I think specifically according to, let's see here. You know, data sharing and collaboration are fragmented. Patients have no incentive to receive treatments that are otherwise available to them. Fraud and corruption can seriously hinder healthcare efforts in different regions uh, and lack of education can also lead to suboptimal health outcomes. So um, I'll be watching them. I don't know too much about them. They have this token rewards program and staking. So I don't know how legitimate they are in the healthcare space versus just another crypto venture using healthcare as an application. So not to talk negatively about them. I just don't know them well enough. So if you're listening Immunity Life, I'd love to have you on and you can maybe discuss immunify.life. Sorry, you can um, explain. Uh, my offer is interesting, Ray, because take a look at these articles we present. The first half of the discussion was talking about security and vulnerability assessments and meeting security criteria, which Wendy elaborated on beautifully. And then we flip over to articles saying, oh, we have a tokenization system for lab data. Uh, okay, show me the vulnerability assessment. Right, um, yeah. You know, we, we somehow are allowed this, this, this cognitive dissonance that both are okay at the same time. Good point. You're right. Um, yeah, so those are the articles. I did have some educational nuggets as well. There's a video, we won't watch it now, but it's a video on how Web3 is all about communities. And you need to build one with a story. So the story of your Web3 community is very important. Um, and there's an A16Z article about DAO governance attacks and how to avoid them. So this is very interesting. It's pretty dense as well, but very, very useful. Um, it includes like, you know, increasing the cost of acquiring voting power, increasing the cost of executing attacks. So it discusses details along those lines. So here, this is the, a framework for assessing and addressing vulnerability. So we're just talking about this. So to analyze the vulnerability of different projects, we use a framework captured by the following equation. So profit to attacker is the summation of the value of the attack, the cost of acquiring voting power. So what does it cost to have the, enough voting power? to make that change and the cost of executing that attack. So if the value, if it's worth it, you know, they'll, they'll execute on it. So this is sort of a simple framework. Um, again, a lot of uh, things to consider in a DAO and governance. So um, interesting, they use Steemit as an example here. The voters use their Steam tokens to choose the witnesses. 
what followed was a public back back and forth. Yeah. Uh, has anyone used Steam it recently? It used to be like a supposed to replace Reddit on Web3, but it didn't really take off. So that's interesting. And finally, uh, did, I did also include this roundtable with Wendy uh, that happened uh, last month or very recently, actually. So you can watch that. It's on YouTube as well. It's with uh, the Government Blockchain Association. So just wanted to include that in here as well. So thanks, Wendy, yeah, for doing thank that. Thank you for sharing. And I wanted to thank some of you in this audience here for attending and asking great questions during the session. Um, while we are open, uh, I wanted to point out um, that a few of us put some links in the chat today in uh, reaches for additional articles um, that have come forward. Uh, when organize uh, like I put in one um, that has a title. It's the um, it's it's a LinkedIn article, but it talks about how blockchain technology and healthcare market is expected to grow 68.3% CAGR. And it has some great images about where and how um, it's going to grow. This is the type of information that I like to share with prospective customers to say that this isn't hype, this is real, and organizations are implementing it. And here is a market assessment. So um, I also put in um, some additional links about security and computing power. So just uh, additional information for you all to examine. And I personally am going to use this, uh, the market technology and healthcare, let's see, the blockchain technology and healthcare market expectations in some of my promotional materials, because I think it's a, it's a powerful message about how much growth there really is. Excellent. Thank you. And with that, um, is there anything else members would like to share? Any other comments or events or anything coming up that you'd like to share here with the community. And I, I will also know, I'll add some of the links and messages that were sent in the chat and I'll put it directly in the agenda comment section so people can look at it later on. Uh, hi, Ray, uh, this is Ramesh. Uh, uh, currently now we are implementing the uh, health chain use case, the congestion model uh, in one or two weeks, you know, I'll post it in the community. So how the people who are in the health consortium you know, exchange the information between the hospitals and in the secured manner and that we are you know implementing in the hyperledger fabric so i just wanted to showcase it in a uh, healthcare group so, so that's very you normal know, we can grow the community so that we can kind of ramesh i'm sorry. very sorry your audio seems kind of low my friend we I, I at least personally couldn't really hear you very well yeah, same here, Ramesh. But if there is, I think you mentioned you're working on a project related to helping hospitals connect data or something like that. But if you have a link maybe or contact info, you know, if you want to put it in the chat, that might be helpful. Sorry. Uh, currently, it is in progress. Most probably for the next week, I, you know, I would like to share it to okay. the health community group, actually. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, let me know. You can send me an email. Um, that would be interesting. Sure. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Ramesh. So he was just saying that he's working on a project and he'll be closer to being ready soon. And he wants to share it with the community. Cool. Excellent. Look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Well, with that, everybody, um, thank you. Appreciate it. I hope you had a good meeting. I hope you enjoyed this and had something, you learned something from it. Um, have a great Wednesday and we hope to see you back in two weeks. So thank you again. Really appreciate it all. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Well done. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.